Here in Minnesota, we're surrounded by an ocean of renewable carbon in the form of plants such as trees and grasses. And we call this material biomass, and we'd like to use that to create an entirely new industry of biochemicals and biomaterials. Now, why is this important? If you look at all of the things you use every day, they're made up of carbon. All these different products that you can see are made up of carbon mostly derived from fossil fuels such as natural gas and petroleum. And so the question becomes, in 100 or 200 years, we're still going to need these types of materials in everyday use for food, for medicine, for agriculture, for transportation. And so what are we going to do that makes these types of materials and these types of industries sustainable? And to think about that, we need to go back to actually where we started and what we do today, for the most part. And that's the status quo of the carbon chain. So right now, we take carbon out of the ground in the form of natural gas or petroleum. Out of that, we pull out chemicals such as two, three, four, five or six carbon chemicals like you can see there. And then we, what we do polymerize where we connect those into big long chains and those are heavy and that's what we think of as solids. We call those plastics or the chemists call them polymers. And ultimately then we can put those into the products we use every day like bottles or shirts or cars. Now the problem with this is multifold, right? The feedstock here is non-renewable, right? There's a limited supply available uh, on earth. And on top of that, there's waste generation. What happens at the end of life of these types of products, polymers, and plastics? Well, what we can do is think about improving that entire system by looking at this several different ways. Number one, we don't have to take the carbon from fossil fuels. Here in Minnesota and many other places, we're surrounded by carbon that comes out of CO2 from the air and is stored as biomass in trees, grasses, and these types of materials. And the other thing is, it's not just a one-way path. We take the carbon from biomass, we make chemicals, then we make plastics, then we make materials, but we can take this back the other way. We can recover the polymers and plastics from materials, recover the chemicals and use them again, or we can biodegrade something all the way back to biomass again. So the question is, how do we do this here in Minnesota? In Minnesota, if you look at a, a map of the United States that identifies, this was put together by the US government, Lignocellulosic biomass, this is the types of non-food biomass that exist around the country. Minnesota is uh, strategically placed in the sense that we have access to a lot of carbon that is renewable. And that comes in the form of forestry in northern Minnesota, grasses, and agricultural residues like corn stover in the south. So the question is, if we were going to put biorefineries around Minnesota to process that carbon to the materials we use every day, how are we going to do that? And that goes back not only to chemistry and engineering, but also economics. We have to be competitive with fossil fuels if we're going to replace them as the feedstock of choice. And so we can think about where we start with. Well, from all these different biomass and plant sources, we pull out a molecule called glucose. And you can see it here in green. It's this hexagonal shape. And from that, you can look at the price. The cost to take that out is about 10 to 15 cents per pound of carbon, which is actually quite low. And if you think about where we're going, if you look on the right, this is one example. This is a molecule on the right in red called paraxylene. And that's the key molecule that shows up in polyesters, such as plastic bottles, clothing, car parts, etc. And that's actually a relatively cheap chemical. It's about 60 to 80 cents, depending on the, when you buy it and where you buy it. So we have to think about a process that can take glucose and green that we get from biomass and convert it to paraxylene cost effectively. And there's several ways to do that in terms of chemistry. In this picture, all of the dots are different chemicals, and all the lines are different chemical pathways. So of the hundreds of options, we can think of kind of a couple of these. If you look at the top path, you can see that you actually end up with a price above commercial paraxylene, which means it's too expensive, and we wouldn't make, be able to make that cost effective. Whereas the other processes actually end up below, and we can think of those as cost-effective technologies. So what are the technologies that A, actually make this economically viable? Well, this is what we work at here at the University of Minnesota. What are the types of chemistries and process technologies that can do this? And here's one example we've been working on for the past decade. On the left, again, we start from glucose, which is what we can get from grasses and trees. And then we can convert that six-atom ring, that hexagon, to a five-atom uh, ring, which we call furan, and then convert that even further by taking off the oxygens. Now, the key uh, contribution to this, the part that hasn't been known for a long time, we discovered here at the University of Minnesota, where we can actually add another molecule that we get from ethanol, and then we can, in two steps in the reaction you see here, we make this molecule paraxylene. Now, the key part of this is that we use what's called a catalyst. A catalyst 
is a material which can accelerate the chemistry and make the reactions do what we want, essentially. And they're, they're difficult in the sense that we have to make these atoms behave the way we want. And so we start out, usually they're not very good. And you can see this in the plot on the left. What you're looking at here is essentially the performance in pink, uh, the yield of the molecule we're trying to make. And you can see when we started out, we were getting very low yields of about 30 to 40%. And over time, as we keep improving these catalysts, we eventually get up to something that's over 97% uh, effective at producing paraxylene. Now, what is that material? Now, what you're looking at here in this picture is an electron microscope image in the top left where you're actually looking at nanoparticles. Now, these particles are about 200 nanometers in size. So if you put, lined up 200 of these end to end, they would be the width of a human hair. But within these are actually uh, what we call nanospaces or pores, where molecules can go in and react and do the chemistry we want. So we can design those holes, those nanopores within the structure to direct the chemistry we, we, the way we want. And the effect of this being so uh, efficient at making the molecules we want has a huge benefit for the economics. So if you look here on the right, this is our progress in terms of performance of the catalyst each year compared to its impact on the cost of the biorenewable chemical. And what you can see is that when we start, the catalysts aren't very good and the price is high. And as we improve and improve, we eventually cross over the red bar, which is the cost to, make, uh, to, to sell uh, paraxylene made from uh, fossil sources. So this is now an economically competitive bio-renewable chemical that goes into a lot of products that we use every day. And there's lots of chemicals like this. If I go to another technology, again, we can start with glucose that you see on the left that we can get from plants. And in three steps now, I can go from glucose all the way to the molecule you see in the top right, just to the right of that red arrow, called isoprene. And if you take isoprene and link many of them together, you get a, a, a big polymer, plastic, that we call uh, po uh, polycyst isoprene which is essentially a car tire. Now, how do we get there cost effectively? Well, we want to do this as in as few steps as possible, and we want the catalyst to be as efficient as, at each step as possible. So what you can see here is in the second step, we use a nanoparticle made up of two, uh, two different metal atoms. And we can tune the, the composition of those nanoparticles to be as efficient as possible in that chemistry. So you can actually see if I change the amount of rhenium versus the amount of palladium, at about 20% rhenium in that nanoparticle, I get the maximum rate of conversion of that chemistry. And then if I take the catalyst we invented last time, the nanoporous material, and incorporate that into the third chemistry, I get an overall highly efficient process to go from glucose from plants to the key chemical in car tires. Now that's just in the laboratory, in, the, in little beakers and stirred tank dishes. But to go to something like a big refinery, we have to scale this all up. And so when we do that on paper, it looks like what you see here in this picture, and there's a lot of details you don't need to know, but we can cost out how much does it cost in these big containers and how much it costs to operate. And when we do that, based on this design, we can actually estimate the cost to make renewable car tires. And so what she's looking at here in, in the kind of purple bars is the price that we could manufacture renewable isoprene right now. And the, the, the colors you see in uh, blue are actually the prices in India and the United States for isoprene on the market. Now, we just started this. It's only about two years old, and we're already close within striking distance of making renewable car tires here in Minnesota. But you can see we've identified three significant advantages uh, to the catalyst that we think are realizable in the next five years that can make this economically competitive. Now, this is a very uh, uh, unique way to go about this. We're going to make the exact same molecules that we get from petroleum, and we're going to substitute those into the products you already use. So we call these drop-in replacements. And there's uh, all the molecules that are made from petroleum we can try to make from biomass, which is a good strategy because then we don't have to redesign all the products you use. The other approach, though, is that biomass has a different structure, which means we could make new molecules which have new functionality and actually behave better in different applications. And my third story, I'm going to talk about the molecules on the bottom. That has to do with laundry detergents, which we know from the previous talk, uh, laundry detergents are very important because of the number of chemicals we use. And so what we could do is make the molecule you see in the bottom right, that's called linear alkyl benzene sulfonate. That's the key ingredient you use when you wash your clothes with detergent. And we're gonna propose we use the molecule on the bottom left, which we can make from biomass. Now, if you think about a formulated product that you buy, and you read off the list of chemicals in that, there's a lot of things in there, but it has to have the active ingredient, which in this case, in blue there, is linear alkyl benzene sulfonate, which we get from petroleum. And we put a lot of that in there to make it work. We also have a lot of water. And then everything you see here in green, orange, red, 
uh, are added chemicals that have to go into that formulation to make it work in things like hard or cold water. And we got looking at this and we said, well, what would make the economics really good for this is to not have to add all of those extra chemicals. Let's make an active ingredient that you see here in red, which we call oleofuran sulfonate surfactant, that can actually act and clean your clothes without all of these other chemicals in your particular system. Now, we, the molecule that we invented here has the same functionality as the conventional chemical, but it behaves better. For one thing, it's tunable. If you look at the structures on the left, right, you see that it has similar functionality to the molecule we're looking at, but now we can change little parts of it. That means we can do things like change how foamy it is. If you want to wash your hands with a foamy soap, we can tune that into the molecule. If you want to put uh, detergent into your uh, uh, dishwasher and you don't want any foam, presumably, right, we can take that out. And so that's a unique uh, capability, which means we can put these molecules right where we need them. But the other capability, which only shows up in this biomass-derived molecule, is the stability. So if you take uh, any other surfactant and you use it in cold water or use it in hard water, right, it actually stops functioning. It'll form crystals. And you can see that in this picture you see here on the right. So if I take a vial, like you see here on the right, and I put behind it the Minnesota logo so you can tell if it's clear or not, I can actually put the surfactants in with different amounts of hard water. So you see the LAS is the surfactant, the active ingredient in most laundry detergents. And by the time you get to 230 parts per million, which is where common hard water is, it actually starts forming crystals and stops functioning. But the OFS, the biorenewable surfactant, is crystal clear even up to 10,000 ppm, which is like seawater. Which means we can use these molecules in all sorts of places without having to add all of these other chemicals. Now the ability of st the stability combined with the ability to tune these molecules means we can use them all sorts of places. And here at the University of Minnesota, we've been thinking of all the different application spaces. And we patent the technology so that we have the ability to translate it out into the marketplace. And so uh, if you think about these molecules, we tune them. Then they, when you put them in water, they form these spherical structures. Those structures can then be tuned to give all sorts of different applications. So you can use these in paints. You can use them in detergents, of course, but other places that you wouldn't think of too, such as foods or agrochemicals, where you're going to put this in and spray pesticides or herbicides on plants. Now, this technology is being translated to the marketplace by a startup company out of the University of Minnesota, which is Ceronix Renewables. And that actually is led by a PhD student here from the University of Minnesota, uh, Christoph Crum, and their flagship product is actually one of the molecules I've just shown you on the previous slide. Now, what's exciting is in the next two decades, we have the ability to completely remake the chemical industry here in the state of Minnesota. Like I said, we're uniquely placed in terms of feedstock, but we also have right, the background agricultural setting and the people and the infrastructure to move this carbon around and manufacture all of these products. Um, and now we know what's been a problem for a long time is that people think these materials can't compete economically with petroleum. And actually, it's the reverse. Some of these technologies, when they get implemented, such as technologies like renewable lactic acid, already compete and outperform fossil-derived chemicals. <clears throat> now, on top of that, we can make new chemicals. Right? The chemicals we make right now don't have to be the only ones we use forever. With biomass, it has new functionality, and we can outperform everything else. And like I said right at the beginning, Minnesota is a unique place for this. We have the feedstock. Right? We have the agricultural background. And the University of Minnesota has a lot of expertise in chemistry, engineering, economics, and technology translation. So thank you very much.